Hello, Victor. Hey. <laughs> yeah, glad to see you here. So uh, before you start your presentation, you actually discussion with uh, Alex about the plugins. I would like to use my question, which I ask every speaker today is, what was the first game you created? Could you tell us? So I don't think I really have like a first game that I, that is like worth mentioning because what I like to focus on in me is making a like great tools to help people make games. So I like to see myself as someone that empowers people to make games. So I can like think of many games that I have helped make, but nothing comes to mind as to like something I would have truly made myself. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So it's really uh, like the thing of question. <laughs> Yeah, that's fine. Okay, I think you can start your great discussion. So uh, we'll go away with Matt and we'll leave you here. So, yeah. Alrighty, folks. So uh, this discussion is kind of a little selfish because I was kind of creating it for myself to uh, feed my own like a curiosity um, because I'm extremely into developing plugins, extending engines, etc. So I would suggest you to grab a cup of coffee or a tea and just listen to our discussion about the whole environment uh, of developing a plugin for a big commercial engine that's currently out there in the world. Uh, so uh, Victor, I just give us, I don't know, in two sentences, an uh, introduction of exactly what does your plugin do? So uh, two sentences is not going to be much, but our goal <laughs> with the plugin is to truly bring next generation voxel technology to Unreal to really help people make beautiful landscape that can have caves, that can have like posture generation, can have, that can make planets, that can make real worlds, that can make anything you can think of. And uh, and we want to help with entire pipeline, be it like posture foliage, uh, runtime editing for players, all, all sorts of stuff like that. All right, but why plugins and Unreal Engine? How this idea has come up to you? How was the idea for the Voxel plugin born? Um, it was born a while ago. So basically at some point I was very bored and I wanted to do something with Unreal because I had been mainly working with Unity so far. Um, I had played Astroneer quite a bit before that. Astroneer is like a an awesome like planetary game where you can like sculpt the world and i was like yeah this is truly awesome i want to make the same thing for myself and that truly what started me with the plugin and i was like you know i started with like just releasing it open source and then people told me that i should probably sell that for some money and i was like yeah, this is kind of crazy but i guess i'm going to follow along and yeah several years later i'm like full-time on this and having a lot of fun with it so basically you just uh by an accident run to the idea of making business out of the plugin yeah it's more like i made the plugin and it kind of forced me to make a business out of it so you started to work alone but uh, how many people currently are working on the plugin so we currently have like four people full-time on the plugin and so oh. maybe i can like give you like a, you a small breakdown of what we're all doing on our side i actually have like a slide i can use for this so let me just do this so yeah, it's like four of us and I do the, I'm like the lead engineer in a way. I do most of the core C++ stuff. Then we have like Victor Gussens, which is, I mean, it's a small team. So a lot of people do a lot of different things at once, but Victor Gussens is more focused on project management and it's going to be the one saying that yeah, we actually need this feature. And I can't just mess around playing with the features I want to work on. Then we have Jared, which is doing like an awesome work helping people because one of the, the part of like making a plugin is that you have like pretty big community at the end of the day that you need to help. And so Jared is actually full-time helping all those people on Discord. And finally, we have another engineer since like a few months, Elondas, who helped me to like all the simple stuff we do to add new features and things. All right. So why I'm asking actually, because just recently I was at a conference and there was a presentation from one of the big uh, games that are currently like will be released in the end of this year or maybe in the uh, beginning of the next one. It's a AAA topic. But what I was like, not surprised, but what like just um, made me like, what's uh, made me sure that my idea of the typical game development company uh, organization and roles is consists of. Uh, basically, it was, um, give me a second, I have it stored, like, 13 percent probably oh yes yeah, 17 percent of all the people working on actually developing a game are engineers and all other people are 
narrative, game designers, level designer, artists, street artists, audio designers. So uh, what uh, what do you need to do to make a, a big game? Like a lot of people that are actually not engineers. So uh, a plugin is, and creating a plugin is actually like a little bit uh, a hack to get into the game development where you can just use only engineers <laughs> to make something cool. Uh, yeah, and speaking of which, so engineers are providing a plugin that creates these uh, new features, but actually voxelization is has several impact on both the art design of the game and the. Uh, That's true. Like we do have like a very wide uh, impact of surface of impact in a way. So that's what like something I forgot to mention. I guess that Victor Gusin is, is also like a technical artist. So he also helps with all that part of like, you know, making like material be fancy, all that kind of stuff, which I have no clue about. So indeed, like with the plugin, we're not only engineers, we also need to be a bit artists because we need to help uh, game development companies make the best out of the plugin. So we need to be able to understand artists. We need to be able to work with all kind of, kind of like, as you said, different uh, teams. So yeah, we do, when you make a plugin, you get, you get a chance to focus on engineering, but you need to not forget about all the other part of the game development as well. And you need to make sure to talk to them. You need to make sure to help them in any way you can. And that's one of also, also the big upside of having Victor Gusson on the team because they're always like, yeah, this is nice. But can you, can you add like this one feature, which to me makes no sense, but which is like very helpful to technical artists because they can like help improve, you can help improve the workflow or something. So it's really interesting all, all that kind of plays together. And how do you measure the um, resource budget of the plugin and its effect on the game? Because, for example, even for not for the finished project, but if you have something extremely heavyweight on CPU or GPU bind, and it's, for example, limits um, when an artist or designer opens an Unreal editor and it takes, I don't know, 50 minutes to load the plugin and to process all the data. And then it, it runs, I don't know, and two FPS to actually run the game. It really kills the mood and desire to do anything with the project. So I, what I've seen actually in a lot of times that the, um, even like, designers would like to make the big worlds with a lot of features and a lot of complexity, but due to technical limitation, because they basically cannot work on the big scale, they were limited to small resources and were limited in their imagination. Uh, how do you uh, work with the resource limitation? So basically we have like a very scalable plugin so a plugin can do anything you want, but the more you want, the more you will pay in a way. So we actually kind of leave all that onto the, the teams that want to use it. So most of the time, it's like a, the, tech, the technical artist of the team will start prototyping with the plugin, see what's possible at, at what cost. And that's going to be what's, what's going to determine how much they can do with it. And they're like always very aware that, you know, you can't get performance for free. So there's always a cost to feature. So it's never really been an issue for me. It's like, we provide something and everything at the cost and people like to benchmark for themselves anyway. So they just prototype with the plugin, see how much it costs and what features they can use for what cost. All right. So like there's no metrics to provide uh, the resource budget used by the plugin. So they would, um, I don't know, figure out, okay, I'm making this world too big for the plugin to work properly. Maybe I need to reiterate my idea. So we do often have this kind of discussion with, with it. With, um, about like how big your world is going to be or stuff like that. But it's usually limited to like one specific topic, which is memory management, because it's like one of the only metrics where we can be actively um, have at least an idea of what's going to be the, like, the amount of memory used. So like if you have like a world of like, you know, 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers, we can be like, yep, this is probably going, going to use like, like around one gigabyte if players start to edit everywhere. And if you have like a smaller world, it can be, yeah, this is probably going to be under this budget. But even then it depends on like the amount of edits we are going to make, the type of edits. It depends on like so many parts of your setup that there's no real way to provide like realistic metrics without, without prototyping. We couldn't be like, yeah, you have this amount of voxels, so this is going to cost this amount of memory or this amount of like millisecond per frame. It'd be nice, but yeah, you really need to prototype to see, to see what's happening. Um, so getting back to the hardware requirements, what do you usually, uh, how does the um, 
working environment for a plugin developer looks like. So for the game developer, you need to have like the beefiest CPU GPU because before the game is polished and finished, it will be extremely unoptimized. So you need as much resource put as possible to basically just develop and run the game. What about the plugins? It's, um, I, would, I would say in many ways, it's uh, very similar. You definitely need a very powerful CPU because you're still going to compile C++, so without a powerful CPU, you're just going to wait. Um, on the GPU side, I would say the same thing as game development maybe applies. So you want like a powerful GPU, but not too powerful because you still want to like uh, keep in check with what your actual target will be. So I was like actually discussing with one of my clients the other day whether they needed to buy like a 4090. And I was like, 1490 is probably like way out of scope because you're going to lose track of like what people are actually going to play the game on. So yeah, I would say like probably like a mid to high tier GPU and a very powerful CPU is what I would recommend for a plugin. All right. And um, in the UZ environment, um, do you use like a CI CD pipeline? We do actually. I can show you some of that if you'd like. Uh, so we have like, we use like GitHub Actions. And so what we have is we have a trigger every time we push something to the plugin repo. We have a build machine that's going to fetch the plugin and package it and package it for like different platforms. So that's most of the CI we have. It's like many checking compilation. That compilation works like in editor, on Linux, on whatever platform you can think of. And we don't have any kind of like automated testing for now. We do want to add some automated testing to some extent, especially related to like asset compatibility. So like, you know, loading like old assets and checking that you can still package them, that there's like no er errors loading them. And I don't think we will ever be able to do full on testing where we can like test every t feature with automated testing because that's something that's very hard to do with game development. But I do hope that we will be able to do some amount of automated testing because it will, it would be actually very useful to be like, yep, I can make changes and I can rely on the CI to tell me if I, if I did something wrong. All right. Um, as I see, GitHub Actions, but how does it work with the propriety SDKs and like building plugins for some platforms that are not uh, openly available? So it's a bit of a trick question, but the, the simple answer is that we currently don't target these platforms on GitHub. When we have client targeting this platform, we have access to the SDK through them. And so basically we see like they're doing the beta testing for us in a way for this platform because we don't have access to this platform otherwise. Um, I say question with game engine is it's Unreal Engine and the plugin for the Unreal it Engine. Is. And speaking of the environment for the Unreal Engine, what is your, like, how does your release cycle looks like? Is it like a uh, feature-based or like, uh, I know, agile-based, sprint-based? So I would say it's uh, pretty messy. So that's what I would qualify your current uh, release cycle. Um, mainly due to the fact that this, as I said before, it's like, I've been making this plugin for fun and then at some point it turned into a business. So a while ago, I think I have like a slide somewhere I can maybe show this to give you some context. So yeah, so like at first I released on GitHub when it was open source and then I released on Google, I released on, marketplace, on the marketplace, I released like a few version when it, when it was mostly feature improvements. So it was like 1.0, 1.1, 1.2. And then when I switched to working full time on the plugin, I kind of went dark in a way, and I'm kind of working on like a big 2.0 release, which has a lot of cool stuff, but isn't ready for release yet. So we haven't really had a release since Q4 of 2020, which is why it's pretty messy right now. So what we do want to do moving forward is follow some kind of something, something similar to the Unreal versioning. So like you would have like 2.0.1 for like a hotfix, 2.0.2 for another hotfix. And if it's like a big new feature, it would be like 2.1. And uh, yeah, hopefully that answers your question to some extent. All right. Uh, and the next question was, how do you deploy your plugin? So I, I know from the first hand, because I've made quite a few plugins to support integration, right, and the uh, Unreal Engine, that official Unreal Engine marketplace allows you to upload only builds of the plugin for the last three official releases of Unreal Engine. So for example, if it's currently the official release is 5.0, you are allowed to 0.0 for 27, 26. So for example, how do you backport features, etc.? The The short answer is that we don't because uh, supporting three versions is already a lot. So 
the amount of code required to support the old version is actually quite uh, quite a lot. So we usually only support like the two latest version, maybe the three latest version. And if you have like basically if someone is like work, still working on four thousand twenty six, it's a pretty big studio that's like locked because they're like already in production. So what we do is that they just reach out to us and we try to figure out something for their use case specifically. So if they need specific features, we can just like work on backporting these specific features instead of backporting everything. But yeah, generally speaking, we just support the latest version and maybe the second latest one, but not much further than that. Um, Why well, I'm asking because we had a few requests from pretty big studios asking for 4.19 support because they have custom range of the engine. And as far as it goes, I think the Mortal Kombat 10 that wasn't like it's no game, but it's not old. Uh, was made to using the Unreal Engine 3 when the Unreal Engine 4. I guess 19 was already in the wild. So you're kind of missing on a big projects right now. This does support so, all the versions. I think um, I think it's pretty interesting because on the plugin side, um, basically you're not going to start using the plugin in the middle of production. It's going to be something you're going to start using at the very like in pre-production. So what we see is that the people we are talking with now are like people in pre-production. And so this is also like a latest, uh, another version. We actually never had the issue of like, like not supporting older Unreal version has never, never truly been an issue for us, I think. Because if you don't use a plugin already, it's unlikely that you're going to start using it. Unlike like a more simpler tool, like something like editor only or something like that. All right. Um, one thing that I've uh, forgot to ask, apart from the hardware requirements, of course, you need a beefy um, uh, computer. What are the like software requirements? Uh, like, what tools are you using to develop plugin, and what skills, like language or like pipeline stuff, do you need to know to make a plugin in a real engine? I think it's pretty much the same as game development. In Unreal, so we, I mean, I use Visual Studio with Three Sharper. You can use Rider. You can use whatever like JetBrains tool of your choice, I guess, since we're on this stream. Uh, and um, so it's mainly C++. There's a bit of C Sharp for like the build system of Unreal. And then uh, there might be some like other scripting languages if you want to, yeah, if you want to make like a CI pipeline, you can use some other languages. But mainly C++ would get you very far. All right. And if you would get access to a genie from the Epic Games company who would grant you any wish and like improve the environment and pipeline and stuff or the feedback queue for plugin developers, uh, what would it be? Like, what would you improve in the current situation? So on the engine side, I would say there's not much to improve. Like I'm already very happy with all the, like, the interfaces we can get uh, when like one of the most uh, the most annoying thing is when you want to use some engine features that's not exported. Like when the DLL does not export the feature because then you can like, you can use it, but it's not going to link, which is always very annoying. But you can always like reach out to Epic and most of the times they will help you with that in the next release. I would say the most, uh, the, the thing I would change is probably on the marketplace side. There are like a lot of people complaining about the marketplace for very good reasons because we're missing quite a few features. So if I had a genie, I would probably give the marketplace a lot more funding and a lot more like people to help make it like a even more awesome place. All right. Um, so actually, um, what I've missed, uh, I wanted to run the the present background, the presentation of the games that actually use your plugin, so people basically understand and figure out what is your plugin and what's used for. Um, Sounds good. Should I just go through them maybe? Um, I am currently... Yeah, can you open your presentation? Because I think I have something to work with one. Uh, so just to give me a show what uh, projects your plugin can sneak into if you are working on. So. Uh, if I see you working on a plugin or any middleware technology, kind of opens a uh, gate into the uh, game development world in a term that you kind of have an option to collaborate with different studios, with different games. So making a plugin that's um, widely acceptable and that is easily integratable can get you to talk with many game development studios and work on different small and big projects of yours. Um, 
So kind of ran through pretty quickly with almost all the questions that I had for the um, for our interview. So maybe we can uh, get down to the questions from the audience if we have a lot. May I drop a so question you, if, if, if you yeah, please go ahead. With that? Because I'm really, really interested. So I'm like, I was listening to you and I felt like maybe a little bit confused because I was thinking like, should I start creating plugins for a game development or should I start with actual implementing the games? So what would be the choice? So how should I decide? Because this all sounds fantastic, but like, imagine I'm a complete newbie. So, and I'm thinking where to start with as maybe transitioning from software development to game development. So where is it better to start? What are the pros and cons? So what would you recommend? So it's actually pretty fun because I would say it's like a very gray line between the two because you have a lot of people making a game and making like an awesome system for the game. And then at some point being like, yep, I can probably make a plugin out of this. And then just move the code to the plugin and like start selling this plugin. This is, I think, maybe 50% of the plugin on the marketplace start like that. And same for the plugin, you can actually start making a plugin and then make a game out of it. So I think what matters is really what you want to make. Find an idea you find fun, focus on it. And as long as you make tech for it, like the tech will not disappear. You can like then make something out of the tech. But uh, yeah, my point would be start with doing something and don't worry too much about, about like making a plugin or game. It's going to work fine in the end anyway. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And talking about the learning curve, maybe um, like for the newbie, like for example. So how like how is it different to the learning curve for the game development? Or is it just the same? Um, I mean, like, do I have to learn any extras or maybe something different? To I, am, I am very tempted to say it's pretty much the same because a lot of the time you also want to make plugins for your game as like part of your design, like a, as part of your product management. You probably want to already make plugins in your game so that they're like neatly like separated features. So I would say they're pretty much the same and they're like only very few technical like knowledge you need to know to make a plugin. Like it's, you can just like go through the doc in like probably alpha day and you're going to know everything you need to know about plugins. So I would say the important part is, yeah, it's the same. You're going to be using the same Unreal features. You're going to be using the same C++. So it's pretty much the same like learning curve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What I would suggest in this case, um, so you kind of can get in a situation where I, a Unreal Engine has a lot of feature actually integrated into it, but it's disabled by default. So you can easily get into a situation when you are making a plugin for the feature that has been there for, I don't know, for centuries, but it's not like properly documented. Or maybe there's like tons of the marketplace plugins. So making a plugin, I would say would better start with actually making a game a specific game with specific uh, limitations, uh, gameplay mechanics, etc. And in order to fulfill the requirements, you kind of create a plugin. And from that point, you kind of already know your target audience and you know how to kind of market it. By the way, how do you market your plugin? <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, another fun question. Um, I would say mainly it's like word of mouth and that can be like on Twitter, that can be on Discord, that can be on Reddit, but mainly it's just like, you know, every few days you post like a, a tweet about some feature you're working on or something and that's how marketing is done, I think, for the plugin. And in a way, it's also pretty similar to like marketing a game. You just regularly post nice, can or nice videos about your game and uh, you hope for the best and that people will find you at the end of the day. But isn't um, it like harder to push people um, like to know and to learn more about the plugins? Because I, I think like the people say, okay, so I need to create a game. I will take the game engine and I have everything. Why do I need some extra plugin from some third party company? Why do I have to think about it? So how do you push people to actually dig into it and to believe that they really need it? So what you need is to show some features that's like unique and very visually appealing, I think. So one, I mean, I can show a quick example. Uh, so if I just spend this video. So like if we look at something like this, it's something that you, you cannot see in like the regular Unreal Engine. It's like you're like possibly like spawning trees using like a brush modifier. You can like move big brushes and you're like, okay, I want to generate this huge world. I can, at first you're probably going to try using like the Unreal landscape. And then you're going to be like, yep, I need more than this. And then you start looking online for new tools. And that's where the plugin is coming to play. So it's more like marketing needs to, in a way, marketing needs to come later almost because it's people need to look for you first. 
I need to fulfill a need. So people really need to find out they need the thing first, I would say, before. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not like you can force people to use to use a plugin. It's like you find a problem, you fix it, and then you just have to tell people that, yep, this is how I fixed it. And people will encounter the problem, will look for the problem online, and will find you eventually. Okay, so to me it sounds it. like it's it's maybe uh, the same uh, as complex as maybe marketing, you know, profiling because until you actually run into the problem, you don't know you have it, and you are not thinking about the solution. You are not looking for it, so that's not something maybe really to some obvious. Extent, yeah. You can think in advance. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I like to think it's a bit more. It's a bit easier than profiling because profiling tends to be very technical and pretty hard to see. Whereas, like for us, for instance, it's like okay, you want to make a cave. In Unreal, you're going to look some, for some YouTube videos on, on how to make a cave. And at some point, you're going to be like, yep, yeah, probably like find a video about us or find a video about like voxels. And you're going to be like, yep, yeah, do I want, is there like a voxel plugin for Unreal Engine? So it's a lot more organic, I would say, with features like that because you're like, yeah, I want to make caves. It's not like I want to make my, my game faster. It's I want to make caves. I want, I want to have this specific feature or do I make this specific feature? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Sounds it cool. kind of sounds a problem of a chicken and an egg. So in order to market, <laughs> you need to sh uh, showcase, and in order to showcase, you need to uh, uh, consumer that actually uses your plugin. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, That's yeah, kind of, kind of this kind of problem. So I'm actually wondering. So who are usually the creators of these kind of plugins? Are these usually the game studios who run into some issues and started creating the plugins, or are these completely different? You know, companies who are just you know keen on creating plugins. So this chicken act problem, how, how is it going there? <laughs> so from my experience, a lot of the people are people who work on the game, maybe for companies, but for companies, it tends to be trickier because you have like IP issues because like the company owns the IP and they're often like not interested in like actually selling the plugin. But a lot of the time, yeah, people working on a game and making an awesome game and making like an awesome plugin in their game and being like, yep, I want to extract this plugin and I want to share this plugin with other people as well. And yeah, to me, that's like the top uh, story for like plugin cutters, making a game, making awesome features for the game and extracting a plugin out of it. Okay, okay, cool. And maybe you can name just a few other known examples of the various plugins uh, for like different engines so that we kind of understand the scope for the plugin. So what are usually the functionality covered by the plugins? Um, so I'm not going to be able to name much for Unity, but for Unreal, which is what I'm familiar with, you're going to have plugins that, um, I mean, it's such a wide landscape, but you're going to have like editor plugins that help you with editor shortcuts that help you make you much more efficient in like the editor. So you can, you have, we'll have stuff like, um, I think it's called like Node Assistant on a, in Unreal, which lets you do a lot of, um, makes you like work a lot faster with Blueprint. So you can just, just like drag your mouse and it's going to auto connect the pins for you. It's going to do a lot of fancy stuff like that. Then you have like game features plugin. So you have like a lot of locomotion system, a lot of system that, yeah, around players. So like, you know, a plugin that lets you like ride a horse or a plugin that lets you kill other people or stuff like that. And then you're also going to have like more, I would say like us, like more landscape based plugin maybe. So like plugins that help you make water for your game, that help you make landscape for your game, that help you with procedural generation, that help you with procedural foliage. So truly you have like all kind of plugins and it's pretty hard to like throw pretty good uh landscape of them okay okay cool and yeah by the way the the audience if you name some cool unity plugins uh because we're mostly we're discussing real plugins you can name them in the chat we'll be happy to learn more uh, i actually have a question regarding like these plugins how often do they become the part of the mainstream engine so do they usually merge uh at some point of time or do they still stay independent so what's the usually you know life cycle for such plugins so it Depends. We, so I guess you mean do plugin usually get integrated into Unreal itself mm -hmm. at the engine level? Yeah. So this is more of like a business question, I guess, because it depends on like whether Epic is ready to buy the plugin or what, or like the plugin company. And there are like a few examples of plugins being bought by Epic, but it, I think it's really like more on like, it's probably like one or maybe two or three examples like that, but most of the time they stay on independent. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. That's interesting. I don't know, like, if anyone uh, from the audience knows some similar stories about the Unity, we'll be happy to hear them um, in the chat because I'm really interested in how these 
like it sounds to me like two parallel curves in the game development you know those who are working on the maybe even free like the game engine itself the games and, and the plugins and they kind of interact so I, i'm wondering at what point of time and at what conditions do they usually merge into each other's and how often does that happen so just to understand how the market looks like <laughs> no yeah. that does make sense and um, when i what i like to to think is that when you work on a plugin you're you're very close to working on an engine because you follow the same principle you need to like uh, care a lot about like um code quality in a way probably more than you would like in a for code that you can be used in one game you need to care about apis you need to care about docs so in a, in a way it's very similar to developing, developing for an engine but you're like um more limited in scope i guess Okay. There is a good question from the audience. So we see uh, leap to use the 5.0. Uh, was it hard to migrate uh, your plugin to a new version? So um, yeah, that's a question. Yeah. Um, so Epic did a very good job with 5.0 with adding a lot of stuff to make it very easy to migrate. So I think migrating to 5.0 was like literally like half an hour of work on my side. And uh, of course, it's been more, more work as we migrate individual features and we need to work with the new features. But overall, it's been very, very smooth. Okay. And there's another question for the volumetric capture. Do you know any other plugins apart from the OptiTrack? Uh, I have no idea what, it, what this means. All right, <laughs> that's fine. Okay, I think that we more, more or less run out of the question. I would like to thank Victor here for being with us and for great discussion. And thank you, Alex, for leading the discussion and bringing so many cool questions. And we actually learn about the plugins, um, you know, and how it all really evolves in the game development. So thank you, Victor.